Hi, my name is Steve Chenitz. I'm an applications engineer for the APID group uh, and, uh, here at Microchip. My main focus is on MOSFET drivers for both switching power supplies and for motor drives. In my past experience, most of my time has been spent with switching power supplies. And recently, after working with some uh, motor drive circuitry, I realized that there are some subtle differences when you're designing the power stage, the drive amplifiers for the motors, which are similar to switching power supplies, but slightly different in the way they operate. So what I'd like to do for this presentation is to give an introduction to um, the motor drives, or very simple motor drives that we use uh, for, for spinning motors, and to work through some of the calculations in order to calculate uh, power dissipation, uh, calculate currents based on uh, application requirements or, or motor requirements, uh, allowing you to properly design and select the MOSFETs and other circuitry in, inside the bridge. So when you finish with this presentation, um, you should be able to understand the basic topologies uh, for driving motors, whether they're brush motors, uh, simple brush motors, or more complicated three-phase uh, brushless DC motors. Uh, should be able to understand the voltages and currents, how they operate, and how to calculate those currents and power dissipations in the drive stage so that you could properly select those components. In addition, we'll go through some, uh, some of the uh, requirements in selecting the driver to power these MOSFETs, as well as for modifying some of the parameters, rise and fall times, um, and then some circuits to help you with um, uh, making the design more reliable and uh, more rugged, in, uh, for example, uh, clamping negative voltages or, or selecting uh, snubber components for the application. So we're going to break this up into a few different parts. Uh, the first part is going to be an uh, overview of, of simple DC motors and simple uh, brushless permanent magnet DC motors. Uh, we're going to talk about the different power stages for driving each one. Uh, and then we're going to go off into doing some calculations, basically getting an understanding for each of the elements in the drive stage, uh, how to calculate currents, how to calculate the power dissipation. And this will help you select those parts uh, for your motor driver. Uh, then we'll go into selecting the uh, driver for the MOSFETs. And then we'll go through some different circuits, um, some tricks in order to get these uh, motor drivers to uh, operate reliably. So let's first talk about um, the DC motors that we're going to cover in this, in this class. There is a, a huge variety of motors, and we can't cover them all in this one class. So we'll focus on some basic ones. We'll focus on some simple single phase brushed motors, self-commutating brush motors. And then we'll also go into uh, simple three phase brushless DC motors that we can use with uh, three phase bridges in, in, in order to drive those. In a brush motor, uh, commutation is done with, uh, with brushes and with a split rotor ring, which means that the electronics used can be very simple. Applying a DC voltage to the motor will allow the motor to spin. Uh, you reverse the voltage on the motor terminals and the motor runs in the opposite direction. And if you vary the voltage across those terminals, the motor will uh, spin at different speeds. Here's an example of a, of a very simple motor model uh, that, that to get a better understanding of how it operates. There's a DC source, and that source supplies voltage to the terminals of the motor. Inside the motor, you have the winding resistance and its inductance. And once the motor is spinning, it generates a back EMF voltage, which opposes the applied voltage at the terminals. Motors, whether they're brushed or brushless, come with different specifications that you could use for your design. Um, some of the uh, constants that they use in this uh, help you determine what the no load speed is and what the current is or requirement is for a certain torque. Uh, in this case, the torque constant, which is K sub T, is, is specified for this motor in uh, torque uh, per amp. The voltage constant is specified in terms of peak voltage per RPM or 1,000 RPM. So knowing what your voltage is, you can calculate the no load speed 
knowing what your uh, torque requirement is, you can calculate the current, or knowing your current that you're applying to the motor, you could calculate the amount of torque it will generate. The speed, as we said before, is proportional to the motor voltage. Uh, so for a given voltage, the, the motor speed can be calculated using uh, this equation, uh, which is the constant times the voltage winding. And in this particular example, for argument's sake, if you have 24 volts on this motor, the no load speed is about 3.3 uh, uh, K. Torque, as we talked about before, is, is proportional to the current flowing in the motor. And using the torque constant of that particular motor, you can calculate what the current is or uh, vice versa, knowing what current you're going to put into the motor, you can calculate uh, what torque it will produce. Another factor that affects the uh, current and, and the amount of torque produced by the motor is the motor efficiency. And for certain conditions, you can get this information from the data sheet of the motor. Knowing that information, knowing what the efficiency is, you can get a more accurate calculation for current or for torque. In, again, in this very simple example, if you want to know what your motor current is, you take what the load that you're driving, the torque that you're driving applying to the load, and you divide that by the torque constant and the efficiency. And in this case, it's about 1.36 amps. On the other hand, a brushless DC motor requires the external electronics to commutate it. And this is performed in a three-phase motor, is performed by a, a three-phase bridge. The change in direction of the motor, okay, instead of reversing the voltage, what you would do is you would reverse either the two of the three phases, you could swap those out, or using your software, using your microprocessor, you could change the order of the pulses in order to reverse the direction of the motor. Speed control can be varied, again, by applied voltage, but it's more efficient to use a pulse width modulated technique. Uh, this way you have better control over your motor speed and, and, and also eventually your applied torque. And um, this will allow you to, uh, to better control the motor in a more efficient manner. So there's also, uh, with a motor, there's the conditions of, of startup. Um, in that case, when you first start up in the motor, you find that your current will be much, much higher than during normal operation. Um, no load operation is when the motor has no load on it and it draws uh, lower current okay, at, at, a, at a given speed. Full load operation is when you have the load on the motor all right, and it draws a little bit more current and it will run at a slightly lower speed. Stall current is when you lock the rotor, when the motor stops spinning, but there's still a voltage applied to it. And in that case, you'll see that the only um, impedance to current is the resistance of the motor winding. And then there's also braking, where you apply essentially a short circuit across the motor terminals to make it stop quicker. And windmilling, which is where an external force spins the motor, and the motor actually acts like a generator supplying uh, power back into your, uh, your bus. So let's talk a little bit about startup. At startup, from our motor model, you see that the back EMF is going to be zero when the motor's not spinning, and therefore the only limitation to current is going to be the winding resistance um, and the applied DC voltage to the motor terminals. Once the motor starts spinning, this back EMF opposes this voltage the voltage across the resistance of the winding is less, and that reduces your motor current. Stall current is when the motor stops, but there's still applied voltage. And again, as with the initial startup conditions, your current is equal to the voltage across the motor terminals divided by the winding resistance. Let's give you an example of a uh, simulation. Um, and this will give you an idea that when you design your drive circuitry for the motor, it has to handle all the conditions, not just the normal operating of the no load condition, but stall currents and startup currents as well. Um, when you design the, the, the circuitry, you have to know what the requirements are for that motor. Um, will the startup take a long time? Will you have to uh, withstand uh, stall or rotor lock? for long periods of time, or is it only quick, 
where the control circuitry will detect it and automatically shut off power to the motor. So in this example, you can see that during startup, initially the current uh, increases very high, limited only by the resistance of the motor winding. As the motor starts to spin, back EMF is generated. The faster it spins, the more back EMF and the less current. Eventually, you hit a steady state for that particular voltage. You hit a steady state back EMF, and therefore your current uh, is also steady state. Now, if you go into a rotor lock condition, the current immediately jumps up because your back EMF is much less. And now you have to withstand um, or supply that much current. So when you design your drive circuitry, you have to make sure that the MOSFETs you select are capable of dissipating whatever power is required to deliver to the motor without overheating. And this depends upon the uh, resistance, the winding resistance of the motor, and also how long you're going to be in this condition. Once you release the motor lock and the motor starts to spin again, the current, as with the initial startup, starts to decrease until you're into a steady state condition. Now that we have an idea of how, of how the two motors are, operate and how we're supposed to supply power to them, let's talk a little bit about the different power stages that we use to deliver power and to control the motor. In this example, we're going to look at a, a simple brush DC motor. In this case, we have uh, a driver, which is a high side driver that supplies power to an N-channel MOSFET. And this MOSFET is what is used to turn the motor on and off. When the MOSFET is off, there's no voltage applied on the motor, it doesn't spin. When you turn the MOSFET on, voltage is applied across the terminals, and current starts to flow through the motor. Once current flows through the motor, it starts to develop torque, and it starts to spin. Now, if you want to control speed of the motor, uh, instead of varying the voltage linearly, which may be an inefficient way to do so, you can switch it with a pulse width modulated signal to the motor, across the motor terminals. And what this does is, depending upon the duty cycle, and duty cycle is equal to the on time, the time the MOSFET is on delivering power, to the overall period of your switching cycle, will average out the voltage to a lower value than the bus voltage or the peak voltage. So in this case, when you want to do a brush motor with a PWM. Uh, in this case, we're doing it with a low side MOSFET driver, which is another way to drive the motor. Uh, there's a, a MOSFET driver. The MOSFET controls power to the motor. The motor is connected directly to the bus. When you turn the MOSFET on, the motor starts to spin. If you're running at a very wide duty cycle, close to a duty cycle of one or, or close to 100%, the motor will spin quickly. If you reduce that duty cycle to one that is lower, the average voltage now delivered across the motor terminal is less, and the motor spins more slowly. And if you apply a very, very narrow duty cycle, the average voltage, again, is much lower. In this way, you can control the speed of the motor by varying the pulse width and the duty cycle of the, uh, of the, of the driver. So let's compare the two. Um, for a brush motor, it's self-commutating. Uh, you can apply a PWM input voltage to control the speed, and this is true both for high side and for low side. Um, and it's very simple to control. Uh, the control circuitry, the uh, processor requirements for driving this are, are very, very simple. Um, the, there's some advantages and disadvantages in using either a high side drive with the MOSFET on the high side or a low side drive with the MOSFET down uh, reference to ground. And with a high side, the advantage is safety. If there's an accident or somehow you short the terminals of the motor um, to ground, there is no voltage applied as long as the MOSFET is off. And so the motor doesn't spin. In a, high, in a low side MOSFET drive application, if you were to short one of the terminals of the motor to ground uh, due to uh, wire abrasion or insulation failure, the motor will spin regardless of the uh, state of the MOSFET. The advantage of using a low side MOSFET driver is it's much simpler. Uh, you're ground referenced. You don't need a charge pump to boost the voltage on the gate of a high side MOSFET above the bus voltage. 
And so it's cheaper and simpler to do it uh, with a low side drive. However, if safety is a requirement, then a high side drive is, is something that must be considered. In each of these applications, and I haven't talked about it yet, uh, there's been a diode that has a uh, connection between ground and the, um, and, the mo and the motor terminal. And this is used uh, essentially to keep the power dissipation or, or the uh, con motor current continuous in the motor. So let's see what happens. When you turn the MOSFET on, current will begin to flow in the MOSFET and then through the motor to ground. But the motor has an inductance and you can't change current through an inductor instantaneously. So when you're either turning this off for control or PWMing it for speed, once this MOSFET is turned off, the current through the MOSFET will um, go to zero, but motor current was always continuous, so that current has to be supplied from somewhere. And what happens is the voltage on this node goes to ground, uh, goes slightly below ground, and at that point the diode turns on and now the diode is able to supply current to the motor, and this keeps the motor current continuous. In, in this kind of application, there is power dissipation in this commutating diode, and that's equal to the forward voltage drop of this diode times the average current uh, of the motor. And that average current of the motor is equal to the off-time duty cycle times the um, the, um, the, at the peak motor current. So now we, let's talk about um, a more complicated drive structure that allows us to, um, to, to provide a more efficient way of, of commutating the motor and keeping the motor current continuous. If we could put a MOSFET here instead of the diode and we can control the state of the MOSFET to be complementary or out of phase with the high side switch, then we can reduce power dissipation in this because we could select a MOSFET that has a low RDS on and therefore when it's conducting current during the off time, it will dissipate less power if you select a MOSFET with a low arm resistance. So, the advantage of having a synchronous switch in the, in the motor is much lower power dissipation. In addition, you could provide electronic braking because when you turn this MOSFET on, which is connected to ground, the other end of the motor terminal is connected to ground. Now you short circuit the motor terminals and you provide electronic braking for the motor. This will stop it instantaneously. But there are some elect extra requirements that are required in a more complicated driver. Now you need both high and low side drive, and you also need circuitry that either through the microcontroller or within the, the driver itself, that makes sure that both of these MOSFETs are not on at the same time. And by in doing this, you turn this both of them off for a short period of time called the dead time, and that ensures that no shoot through current flows through this bridge or this half bridge uh, because both MOSFETs are on. And again, this can be done either in some controllers have this ability, or you could add that dead time into the microcontroller driving the, um, the, the, the driver. All right, so we talked about controlling the speed. Uh, let's talk about controlling the direction. Uh, we said before with a brush motor, if you want to change the direction, you have to reverse the polarity of the voltage applied to the motor terminals. And the full bridge is one way to do this. So if I turn on the diagonal MOSFETs in one direction of the full bridge, then I create a connection from the bus voltage through the motor to ground, and that drives the motor in, let's call it the forward direction. However, if I turn those off and turn on the opposite diagonal MOSFETs, that applies a voltage reverse from what it was originally applied, and that will drive the motor in the other direction. We could also use this full bridge configuration as we saw um, with the half bridge, with the synchronous half bridge, we could use it for electronic braking. And in this case, for example, when we have the motor running in one direction, what we would do if we wanted to stop it quickly is to turn off, for example, this low side, 
MOSFET and turn on the other high side MOSFET. And what this will do is, regardless of, we'll short the terminals, both terminal motors, to the same source, whether it's high or you could even turn on these two, which would return it to ground. In either case, the motor terminals are short-circuited and the motor will stop. So that covers the basic um, brush motor uh, applications, driving them, changing the speed, uh, controlling the direction of the motor using the half bridge and the full bridge or, or even just a simple high or low side drive. So let's talk about the slightly more complicated three-phase motors. Um, in order to drive a three-phase motor, most requirements are for a three-phase bridge. There's other ways to drive it, but the most popular and common way is using a three-phase bridge. So each one of these phases is a half bridge configuration, similar to what we saw before for the brush motor. And each one of those has a uh, driver, each phase has a driver, and those drivers are powered from a controller. The controller determines the switching speed, the uh, duty cycle for, for speed control. Um, there's also some feedback that you could provide in order to provide constant speed under different power uh, in these particular applications. But the controller now, because it's operating three phases, has to be a little bit more complicated. The coding has to be a little bit more involved than just a simple brush motor. Some of the waveforms, let's take a look at some of the waveforms. If we look at the, the waveforms on this, um, the, uh, we have the motor current, which is these uh, grayish or grayish blue waveforms here. And then we have the voltage across the, each of the three windings of the motor. And you can see that each of the motors um, will run the, the voltage applied for uh, about 60 degrees out of 360 degrees in the electrical cycle. Um, in this particular case, we're running at 100% duty cycle, but each of these waveforms can be PWM'd to give you a lower average voltage and control the speed of the motor. These are idealized waveforms. The, the actual uh, current waveforms will have some ripple in them um, during the commutation periods. Uh, but just for an example, this gives you an idea of, of what the, each of the individual phases uh, and how they're driven. So you get a better idea of, of, of how the motor operates during this, this time. Uh, here we have a three-phase bridge. Um, here's the three-phase motor. And in this particular control scheme, we're calling it six-step commutation uh, because there are six individual steps or, or transitions of the MOSFETs, of the, of the six MOSFETs, um, in order to properly control the flow of current through the motor and drive it. During the, the first um, period of operation, we have uh, winding C and B energized. So current comes from the input supply through this high side MOSFET of phase C, goes through the two windings back into phase B. And if you look at, at at um, this diagram of a two-pole, three-phase motor, you'll see that phase B and phase C are energized. Uh, phase B has the same polarity as the south pole of the magnet, and so it pushes that away from the, the uh, stator. And that phase C has the opposite polarity of this magnet, and it pulls the, or rotates towards this phase. But once you've rotated uh, for 60 degrees, you have to change the phasing in order for this to op continue to operate. And so what you do is you, instead of having phase C and B turned on, you switch the power uh, from phase C over to phase A. So now the current flows from phase A winding through phase B and into ground. And so if you watch how the, the polarity of the motor changes, now phase A and B are energized, and they wrote, continue to rotate the, um, the rotor, uh, the permanent magnets and the rotor uh, in the same direction. Once you're past the 120 degrees, now you go into uh, a conduction period for A and C. So the low side of B is turned off, 
the low side of C now is turned on, and you have current flowing through windings A and C. And you continue this process through all the steps of the, uh, of all the six different steps of, of the, of the three-phase bridge, turning on and off the different MOSFETs in order to properly rotate and, and phase the motor correctly. Now, one thing I want to point out is mechanical versus electrical frequency. So electrical frequency is uh, the, the 360 degrees of the bridge, right? But if you notice, in, in this particular motor, which is uh, uh, three-phase but two separate poles, you don't rotate the motor the same number of degrees as the drive circuitry, as the electrical uh, frequency. So in the beginning, you apply the first 60 degrees of electrical uh, phasing, um, but mechanically, the rotor only turns 30 degrees. During the next period, you turn to 120 degrees electrically, but mechanically, this is only turned 60 degrees. And as you continue through this, you realize that for this particular motor, the electrical and mechanical rotation is ratioed at about two to one. So depending upon the number of poles and the number of phases in the motor, you'll find that the electrical frequency and the mechanical frequency, rotational uh, frequency, is different. And you can calculate the RPM of the rotor based on the electrical frequency, okay, the period of the electrical frequency, and the number of poles. So over here you have the electrical frequency, you have uh, the number of pole pairs essentially divided by the number of pole pairs, and multiplied 60, which converts to revolutions per minute. There are other ways to control the three-phase motor in a bridge. We're not going to go through that in this particular class because it's just going to take too much time. Uh, the calculations for doing a uh, three-phase bridge, bridge with sine wave control could take up a whole nother class. But just to give you an idea, there are other motor configurations that you can use uh, that are wound a little bit differently that operate best from different waveforms, from different drive waveforms. So there's also sine wave control. And if you look at sine wave control, instead of having uh, rectangular or uh, trapezoidal waveforms like you do in six step, they're very smooth sine wave uh, the motor for these kind of drives is wound also in a sinusoidal configuration. And so you get much smoother operation. However, the drive and control circuitry uh, for this uh, operates a little bit differently. Um, but this just gives you an idea that there's other ways to, uh, to drive a three-phase motor. So that gives you a background on the motors and the type of drive circuitry that we use to drive each individual motor. So let's start talking about how to calculate power for all the elements in the, um, in the, in the drive circuitry. Um, we're gonna break this down into two different losses. One is DC losses and one is AC losses. DC losses occur when the device is conducting during the on time for a PWM cycle. AC losses occur when they're switching on and off, when there's a transition. So DC losses in the bridge uh, are basically the RDS on of the MOSFET and the forward voltage drop of the diodes. AC losses, which are frequency dependent, are the turn on and off times of the MOSFET. Um, there's also reverse recovery losses in the diode, which we're going to go into in a little bit, and parasitic capacitance or alpha capacitance of the MOSFET charging and, and discharging. So, Let's take a look at, at uh, power dissipation. During the on time, the MOSFET is conducting current, and with the channel fully enhanced, it has a certain RDS on, um, and that RDS on dissipates power as uh, I squared R, where I is the RMS current uh, through the MOSFET, and R is this channel on resistance. So for a pulse, you can calculate RMS current as the square root of the duty cycle, and we define the duty cycle as on time over period, times the peak current. When you select a MOSFET, 
you have to make sure that you do two things. Number one is that your RDS on, your arm resistance is low enough so that you don't have excessive dissipation in the MOSFET. The other is when you're selecting your driver, you have to make sure that the drive voltage that you apply is enough voltage to fully enhance the MOSFET. You can see here in this graph, there's gate to source voltage for this particular MOSFET versus arm resistance. And in this case, you want to make sure that you have a drive voltage at least eight to 10 volts in order to optimize the MOSFET's RDS arm resistance and minimize power dissipation. So for a continuous pulse, as we, we talked about, the RMS voltage is, or RMS current is equal to the square root of the duty cycle times the peak. But what about periodic uh, train of pulses where you have a number of pulses uh, for your, for example, for PWM control of speed and then an example of the three-phase motor, sometimes you don't drive one of the windings, so current through that particular phase of the MOSFET is off. So you can look at this in terms of two duty cycles. One would be the duty cycle of the uh, PWM train, uh, which is equal to the on time versus the period of the switching frequency. And then there's also the operation time and the period of the electrical frequency, of the electrical rotation of the motor. And once you calculate these two, you can calculate the RMS current using this formula here. Another point of power dissipation, as we had spoke about briefly before, is the uh, DC motor, causing current to flow through the diode, uh, the freewheeling diode of the, um, of the circuit. And you have a forward voltage drop and current flowing through the motor, but current only flows through this diode when this MOSFET is off. So we define duty cycle as the on time versus the period. We could define the operating duty cycle of this diode as one minus that duty cycle times the peak motor current. So the duty cycle is the on time, but one minus the duty cycle relates to the off time. Once you have that duty cycle, you can calculate your average current, and the average current times the forward voltage drop of that diode equals the power dissipated in that diode. So let's talk a little bit about um, turn off in clamped inductive circuits, turn off and turn on in clamped inductive circuits. When you have a MOSFET running, current's flowing through the, mo the motor, and it also flows through that MOSFET. But when you turn off that MOSFET, as we talked about before, current now flows through the diode. However, if we take a look at the switching transition in that period of time, we'll find that the diode cannot conduct instantaneously. It actually has to wait until it's forward biased. So current through the motor is continuous. We look at this as a, as a constant current source. So as the MOSFET is turning off, the voltage across the MOSFET increases, which causes the voltage at this node to drop down towards ground. But while it's dropping down, current still flows through this MOSFET because no current is able to flow through the diode because it hasn't been forward biased yet. In this case, you have power dissipation during this turnoff time in this MOSFET due to voltage across this MOSFET and the current of the motor. Once the voltage at this point goes below ground and allows the diode to turn on, then no more current will flow through this MOSFET. All the current of the motor flows through the, uh, through the diode. So let's take a look at, at um, a little bit about MOSFET turn on. Um, in, this, in this particular case. So if you want to turn on the MOSFET, uh, this green trace over here is the gate voltage. Uh, the blue trace is the drain voltage, and that's the voltage across the drain to source of the MOSFET. And then the drain current is the red trace. As you're first turning on the MOSFET, you increase the gate voltage up until the threshold of that MOSFET. At that point, the MOSFET starts to conduct current. Um, in this range over here, MOSFET current is proportional to the gate voltage. 
So as the gate voltage increases, it allows the MOSFET current to increase. Once that MOSFET current reaches the motor current, then current flowing in the diode uh, that was previously being supplied in the diode can decrease and, and go to zero. And it's only when the diode current decreases and goes to zero can it be um, reversed um, voltage across the diode and then allow the voltage on the uh, switch node to rise up um, and allow the MOSFET to completely turn on. So there's a period here between T0 and um, T1 and T2 where the current through the MOSFET increases. And then once you reach that point, the MOSFET channel is enhanced. Now you have RDS on that you're, um, that you're using in the diode to, to limit the, uh, the current. And so voltage across that can increase. And the drain voltage now can start to go down to zero. So in the period T1 to T2, you have current increasing in the MOSFET. In T2 to T3, you have the voltage across that MOSFET starting to, uh, to drop. So you can calculate power dissipation uh, based on this approach uh, by looking at the voltage and current in the MOSFET. During that time, from T1 to T3, the current increases and then the voltage decreases. And the power, if you calculate instantaneous power in this period, that's the green trace over here, it takes the form approximately of a triangle. And using uh, the formula for area under the triangle, you can calculate the energy dissipated in that particular transition. So, and you have a similar uh, scenario for, for turn off as well. Now, if you take the energy dissipated in that, in that transition and multiply it by the switching frequency, you get power dissipated due to that turn on and turn off. So now the question becomes, how fast do you turn off and turn on the MOSFET? And, and how long will that take based on um, what you're using to drive the MOSFET and the MOSFET characteristics itself? So during turn on, um, the MOSFET driver, which is, is shown over here as having uh, uh, resistance, either pull up or, or pull down, uh, and a gate voltage VDD that's applied that will eventually be used to drive the gate of the MOSFET. So during turn on, um, VDD is applied to the gate of this MOSFET. And there's some resistance in here. There's the gate drive resistance of the pull up of the MOSFET driver. There's any external resistance that you put in. And there's also internal resistance inside the MOSFET itself. The MOSFET gate to source and gate to drain uh, have capacitance, and this capacitance has to be charged or, or, or discharged in order to uh, turn the MOSFET on and, and, and turn the MOSFET off. During turn off, what you do is you take the voltage um, on the gate and discharge it to ground. So in this case, you have the resistance of the pull down of the MOSFET driver, and again, the, any series resistance between the MOSFET gate and the driver. So what we have is, is essentially um, uh, charge and discharge through a, a resistance. Um, and this can be approximated in the turn on um, by uh, looking at how the voltage increases from uh, the threshold, okay, which is uh, at that uh, T1, to the uh, charging up of the gate to source capacitance that we showed before in, in the model. So to calculate that time, um, we can approximate it by the gate charge that's in the data sheet of the MOSFET specs, that's QGS, divided by the current that's applied by the driver. And that current can be calculated as the difference between the VDD voltage on the driver and then this threshold, okay, and any resistance between uh, the gate driver and the MOSFET itself. For turn off, what you're doing is you're discharging the gate to ground, okay? And in this period over here, you have gate to source, the gate to drain capacitance that has to be discharged. So that gate to drain um, charge also is, is pretty much the, the, follows the same kind of formula, but instead of having uh, threshold one here, which was the enhancement threshold, 
Uh, threshold two is, is shown on the data sheet as the point where uh, you start to decrease the voltage on the gate of the MOSFET. And this, by decreasing the voltage on the drain of the MOSFET, the gate voltage appears to be constant because you have the Miller effect. And in this Miller effect, you have uh, what appears to be an infinite capacitance. And so it will sit at this voltage, not charging uh, or increasing the voltage on the gate until the voltage across the uh, drain to source has, uh, has completely uh, fallen. So you can calculate the turn on time by summing up the times for these two periods, for charging up the gate to source capacitance and also the gate to drain capacitance. Turnoff time, okay, is done pretty much the same way, but instead of applying VDD to the gate, now you're taking the gate to ground. Um, during the gate to drain period, during the Miller effect, uh, you're discharging that to ground. And so you can calculate what that time is based on, um, on the charge and then the amount of resistance in the gate path um, and the difference in voltage between the threshold to and ground, the, which is approximately equal to uh, gate to source voltage during this period, and again, between the threshold and, um, and, and ground. So now you can calculate the turnoff time using, again, the time for discharging the gate to drain charge and the gate to source charge down to the threshold. So there are some limitations to a switching speed. Even if you had a very, very strong driver and a very fast switching MOSFET, um, when you turn on a MOSFET, the voltage across the, the MOSFET from drain to source has to discharge to zero. And the way it, that's done is by discharging the output capacitance through the MOSFET. So there's a time constant here of COSS and the um, arm resistance of the MOSFET that limits exactly how fast you can turn this MOSFET off. Conversely, when you're turning the MOSFET off, the voltage across this capacitance now increases. And the only way to do that is to pull current out of the COSS. This is clamped to VDD or the bus voltage. So you have to bring this to ground. And the only way to do that is by removing current the way to remove current is through the motor. So if the motor has a lot of current, this will turn off quickly. If the motor is drawing very, very little current, this will turn off more slowly. So one other point, we were talking about running the motor with a half bridge and the importance of making sure there's no shoot through current. Um, what we do is we add a time delay between the transition of the high side and the transition of the low side, and we call that the dead time, which is the time when both MOSFETs are not conducting. So one way to do that is to control the signals going into the driver. Uh, for example, you take the low input, you bring that low, which turns off the low side, and then you wait a certain period of time, called the dead time, before allowing the high side input to turn on the high side MOSFET. During this dead time, okay, current, remember current has to continuously flow through the motor. During this dead time when both MOSFETs are off, the motor current has to come from somewhere and it will come from this commutating diode, which is either an external diode that you use or the body diode of the low side MOSFET. So during this period of time, during the dead time, you have power dissipation in that uh, body diode or external diode. Now, this occurs um, twice, once during the turn on and once during the turn off, okay, the high side turn on and the low side turn on. And so to calculate this power dissipation in, in the MOSFET uh, body diode, we take the motor current, multiply it by the forward voltage drop, and then we take that multiplied by the dead time and the frequency. And this gives us the average power dissipation, but that's for one transition. Then we can multiply that by two 
for both transitions, the turn on and the turn off. Another uh, mechanism for power dissipation is reverse recovery. We've been using the diode example, but we've been really looking at it as an ideal diode in that when it's on, it's on, and when it's off, it's off. So ideally, um, when the voltage across the MOSFET, when the current through the MOSFET decreases to zero and the voltage over here starts to rise, ideally this diode blocks that voltage. But in a real diode, you have to clear the charge out of the junction of that diode before you can allow it to block. So if you apply a reverse voltage during this time when there's charge in the junction and it hasn't recovered yet, what will happen is it will conduct current through the diode in a reverse direction, clearing out that charge. And you will have a small, a very fast short circuit between the on uh, MOSFET and the high side and the conduction in the diode on the low side. Get a better idea of, of reverse recovery. Um, reverse recovery is uh, the amount of current is proportional to the uh, rate of change of the diode current uh, turning off and the uh, peak current uh, before it starts to turn off. So if you look over here, this is the um, this is time, and then over here this is the current, the diode current. Um, this is forward current current goes through the diode goes to zero. And then as you try to apply voltage across the diode, reverse voltage across the diode, that diode current will flow in reverse until the charge is cleared out of the junction and the current goes back to zero uh, as the diode starts to block. Uh, so this gives you an idea of uh, actual diode. Um, you can see that there's forward current here, goes to zero. In this case, the diode current goes down to about 10 amps um, and then recovers uh, with a little bit of ringing um, on the uh, uh, due to parasitics. So you, during this time, current across the, through the diode um, will force the current, same current through the high side MOSFET. Now the high side MOSFET, okay, is off so this current through the high side MOSFET um, is causing power dissipation in that MOSFET. You could calculate or estimate the uh, power dissipation in the high side MOSFET due to this uh, by multiplying the voltage, uh, the, the bus voltage or input voltage, times the uh, charge of the uh, reverse recovery um, and the switching frequency, and how fast the switch is. And this could actually be fairly significant depending upon the body diode in the MOSFET or, or the external diode that you can use. So to do a, a quick calculation, um, in, in this particular uh, example, we're switching at 20 kilohertz, which is a typical motor frequency, 24-volt um, bus. And the diode inside the low-side MOSFET from the data sheet has, uh, in this example, 130 nanocoulombs of reverse recovery charge. To calculate the power dissipation that occurs in the high side MOSFET, you take the bus voltage, the switching frequency, and that charge, multiply them together. In this case, you have about 62 milliwatts. Now, when we saw before that you turn on and turn off the MOSFET, uh, the uh, output capacitance or parasitic capacitance on that MOSFET is charged and discharged. Um, and that happens through the MOSFET. And when that happens, you have some power. Now, normally, COSS is very small. And because switching frequencies aren't that fast, this usually isn't a significant loss factor. But you can calculate what it is uh, by using uh, the energy inside the capacitor that's stored up, uh, which is 1 half CV squared uh, times the frequency. And in this case, it comes down to about uh, six milliwatts, which is fairly insignificant. So we've covered the, the drive stages, we've covered the motor, and we've covered the power loss in each of the elements for, um, for, the, uh, for the motor drive uh, bridges. So now let's start talking about 
um, how it applies to different uh, power stages. In this stage over here, we have, uh, we'll do a, call it a full bridge example, all right? Um, and how this operates is when you want to spin the motor in one direction, uh, as we talked about before in, in a uh, brush motor in a, in a uh, full bridge circuit, you would control the motor voltage or the motor speed with a PWM signal on the high side and diagonal low side MOSFET is continuously on. And this allows a path of conduction um, through the motor, which allows it to, to spin. Uh, we talked about the commutation diode. When this turns off, you need to provide a path for the current. And in this case, we're using a low side MOSFET to reduce power dissipation. Um, and that's provided by um, a, a two output driver with a uh, complementary PWM signal uh, driving this out of phase with the high side. And in this case, because we're only going in one direction, we're going to leave this high side MOSFET uh, turned off. So let's start looking at power dissipations in each of these elements. Um, there is conduction losses in the upper high side MOSFET during the turn on time. Um, during the off time, there's diode conduction losses. Um, there's diode conduction losses also during the dead time. Uh, there's switching losses in the high side MOSFET. And then there's also the parasitic losses of the uh, reverse recovery of the diode and for the capacitive uh, COSS discharge. So for the uh, high side MOSFET that's switching, during the on time, you can calculate what power dissipation is in that MOSFET. Uh, given these MOSFET parameters in the motor current, uh, we can calculate that the RMS current is about 7 amps. And power dissipation for its operating duty cycle, in this case we pick 50%, uh, is about 1 watt. For the low side, the DC on losses right, are going to be um, complementary to the uh, high side because it is on um, when the high side MOSFET is off. So as we talked about before, you can figure out the RMS current through the low side MOSFET as a square root of one minus the duty cycle times the peak, okay? And in the case of 50% duty cycle, this is about the same current um, and power dissipation is about the same. Um, for conduction losses in the diode, this occurs um, twice every cycle during the dead time. If we program the dead time to be about 500 nan nanoseconds, we can calculate what the average current is through the body diode of the low side MOSFET. And we can, from that, calculate what the power dissipation is based on that current and the data sheet uh, information for forward voltage at that particular uh, diode current. For the right side of the bridge, the low side MOSFET is always on, therefore there's no switching losses. Um, and because it's not switching and it's on continuously, it takes the continuous motor current. So the RMS current at 100% duty cycle through the MOSFET is equal to the average motor current, which is 10 amps. And um, you calculate power dissipation in that as well. And if you notice, there's a, it, it's because we're running at 50% duty cycle, conduction losses are uh, twice as much as they are in each of the individual switching MOSFETs on the left side of the bridge. So if we take the data sheet um, uh, parameters for the uh, MOSFET, for the high side switching MOSFET, and we take the drive, driver data sheet requirements and the gate drive voltage that's applied, um, we can calculate approximately what the switching losses are. So based on, on um, these parameters here, you can see that the gate to source capacitance or, or gate charge as you go from the threshold to where the MOSFET voltage starts to change is about two nanocoulombs. Um, you've got the gate to drain that's about three nanocoulombs. Internal resistance of the uh, gate of the, of the MOSFET itself, um, and you also have an external resistance and the resistance of the gate driver. 
So using uh, the, this information, we can estimate the off time, which is about 47 nanoseconds. And we can estimate the on time, the turn on time, which is about 15 nanoseconds. And it's interesting to note that it's not always symmetrical because when you're driving the MOSFET um, off, you're taking the gate of the MOSFET to ground. And the thresholds of the, the particular MOSFET are in the three to four volt range. So you're, you're at three to four volts and you've discharged that to ground. So there's a certain voltage across that MOSFET as you're discharging it. Now, when you turn on the MOSFET, the voltage on the gate is now much larger because you're using 10 volts. So the voltage applied across all the resistances to charge up the gate of the MOSFET is larger and therefore your turn on time is going to be a little bit faster. So now that we know the switching, we can calculate the switching losses because we know the turn on and turn off time and we know what the voltage and currents are um, across that bridge. So you can calculate the on time um, power dissipation, the off time power dissipation, and you could also calculate the reverse recovery um, in the high side MOSFET and that uh, total switching loss is equal to about 210 milliwatts. And COSS losses are about, as we calculated before, are about six milliwatts. So now the total high side MOSFET power dissipation, okay, is equal to the on, the DC on losses, the switching losses, and then the COSS loss. And we broke this up to give you an idea of, of the magnitude of each of these losses in this particular example. For the low side, the non-switching was just the DC loss, which is two watts, and the low side switching MOSFET, the complementary MOSFET, um, is about 1.18 watts when you add up the arm resistance losses and the, the diode conduction losses. So using that information, you can come up with uh, MOSFET selection and um, uh, based on the, on the, the requirements for the, the voltage drive. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the six-step control um, for, uh, for a, a brushless DC motor. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to figure out the average in RMS currents. We're gonna work on the individual power dissipation calculations and uh, the power um, driver calculations. And we're gonna run this in this particular example at full speed so there's no PWM switching. So just to give you an idea of, of essentially the, a very basic calculation for the, um, for the bridge. So how do, you, how do you calculate the MOSFET currents? Uh, they're based on the motor currents. Uh, you could measure them, which is one good way to do it, do it if you have that ability um, and you have something set up. However, most of the time you'll want to calculate them from the output power requirements of your motor um, or from the torque and RPM requirements. So in this example right here, uh, we had talked about the, um, the constants for uh, calculating motor current based on, uh, on the torque. So knowing the information and having information from the motor data sheet, you can calculate uh, what the motor current is based on the motor's torque constant and the amount of torque or power that is required out of the motor. So let's go over some of the waveforms. Uh, as we had talked about before, motor current in each of the phases, okay, um, and this is just say for phase A, you could see that the motor current through each phase is on for two 60 degree cycles, okay? And what'll happen is the current increases um, in this phase and it will remain constant as long as the two MOSFETs, the one on high side and one on low side, are on. Now when you commutate, for example, the, um, the uh, for example, in this case, the uh, high side MOSFET or the low side MOSFET, you'll see that uh, there's a small ripple in the current um, that occurs until the other phase of the bridge um, supplies current uh, to that uh, motor. And at the end of that 60 degrees, you see that that half of the, that particular bridge shuts off for another 
uh, 60 degree period before turning back on again and conducting in the reverse direction. So if you look at phase A for that uh, particular, driving that particular phase A of the motor winding, you'll see that um, the low side MOSFET will conduct when motor current is essentially running backwards through the winding, okay? And that the high side FET conducts when motor current is running um, in the forward direction or into the motor during, during that winding. There's also some other um, currents that you can see, for example, on the low side FET, uh, during the commutation when the current through the diode um, is flowing, you can see the diode current over here. And then also you'll see little glitches of current um, caused by the uh, discharge of the uh, COSS, of the output capacitance for that particular MOSFET. So based on this, um, we could figure out what the RMS current is, okay, uh, based on the peak current through the motor um, and the on time or the duty cycle of this operation. And in this example, you saw that the, uh, each phase, right, the high side FET was on for approximately one third or 120 degrees out of a 360 degree electrical cycle. You can use this information to calculate the duty cycle the RMS current through the FET is calculated, and power through that FET is also calculated. Uh, the, the difference over here um, is that instead of using on time, you're using uh, degrees of, of conduction. So we, we saw that there's some body diode current. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how this happens. Uh, in this example, let's say phases A and B are on, currents flowing through the high side of phase A through the motor windings and down into the low side of, of phase B. When you turn after you commutate, when you turn uh, phase A off, okay, current's still flowing in this winding due to the inductance. And so now uh, the voltage at this point drops to zero, the diode starts to conduct and will conduct until this winding has completely discharged um, uh, the current, until the current goes to zero. So during that period, you're conducting current through the diode, as we saw in, in the simulation before. And then phase A turns off, um, and now you have current fully running through uh, phase C high side through the motor and then into uh, the low side of phase B. So in order to calculate power dissipated in this, in this diode during this conduction cycle, you have to estimate what the discharge is um, time is for that particular uh, diode. And you could calculate that using uh, the formula uh, V equals L di dt, which is the inductance formula. You can rearrange that to figure out what dt is or the discharge um, and figure out what the average current is by using area under the triangle as we did for MOSFET power dissipation. Once you have that average current, you can now calculate what power dissipation is in this diode through its forward voltage drop at that current uh, times the current. So we've covered uh, basically power arm, uh, arm resistance losses in the MOSFETs for the bridge and also diode uh, reverse uh, or diode conduction losses during the, the, um, the switching cycle. So now let's talk about uh, switching losses in the MOSFET. Because you're not PWMing the um, switching frequency, right? It's just on for that period of time for the electrical frequency or the electrical cycle of the motor. The transition time is very small. When you turn the MOSFET on, when you turn the MOSFET off, it's turned on and off in under 100 nanoseconds usually. But the electrical period for the spinning motor is in the milliseconds, and so the power dissipated during that switching transition time um, is usually uh, negligible. Also, in some conditions, you're turning the MOSFET on uh, under zero current conditions, and in that case, there would be zero power dissipated anyway. Uh, and the same thing with COSS losses. Because your switching frequency or your, your electrical frequency is so low, charging and discharging the MOSFETs um, has a very negligible effect on, on power dissipation. 
So in this case, when you're running at full speed with a three-phase um, bridge for six-step, uh, you can uh, essentially ignore the switching losses. So now let's talk about PWM uh, speed control methods. Okay, before we went through a very simple example where we did 100% duty cycle, just to give you an idea of, of the, the basic power calculations. But now let's get into, uh, which, which would be most motor controllers, where we vary the speed using the PWM technique. So in this case, as we saw with the half bridge example, okay, the high side MOSFET is of, of a particular phase is switched. Okay, the, the low side MOSFET of its uh, diagonal um, uh, counterpart is on constantly all the time. Okay, and so in this particular case, right, as you're switching um, this, this MOSFET, you're going to encounter uh, switching losses uh, as well as conduction losses. So as you, as you can see over here, when you, when you change the phase of the um, MOSFET from B to C, okay, um, the diode um, will conduct during the off time. The MOSFET is conducting during the on time. So uh, phase C on uh, switches on continuously during that, that period of time. So let's look at the, uh, the losses that are incurred. Phase A high side MOSFET has switching and DC losses. Uh, the phase A diode, okay, has uh, V sub F uh, times I losses. And the phase C MOSFET is on continuously, so it has just DC losses. Let's talk about the calculations. Earlier on in the presentation, we talked about a pulse train, uh, calculating the RMS value for that pulse train. And in this particular circumstance, we're going to use that because each of the phases is on for only 120 degrees out of a 360 degree electrical cycle. Uh, again, we're going to assume that we have a 50% PWM switching duty cycle. And because this is on 120 degrees versus a 360 degree electrical cycle, uh, we can assume uh, 120 degrees of conduction. So the duty cycle in this particular example for calculating RMS current through one of the three phases of the high side MOSFET would be equal to the PWM, the switching frequency duty cycle, okay, which is on over the switching frequency period, times the electrical rotational uh, frequency uh, duty cycle, which would be uh, essentially uh, one third, which is 120 over 360 degrees. And using that information, you can calculate the motor's RMS current through the, uh, the high side MOSFET and the power dissipated in the MOSFET during conduction. So just to, to run through an example real quick, if the motor current is 10 amps, the duty cycle is uh, half for the PWM duty cycle and the electrical duty cycle of the motor rotating is about one third, you end up with about four amps for the same 20 milliohm MOSFET, you have a power dissipation of about a third of a watt. So now in this case, because we're not switching this MOSFET, the, the body diode takes all the, um, takes the, the current during the uh, off time of the PWM cycle. Right? And you could calculate that information based on the average current, right, of the motor current and the um, uh, switching frequency. So your, your average motor current, okay, because this is conducting uh, for 120 degree period, okay, current is flowing through here um, for that period of time, uh, you can calculate what the average current is and therefore what the average power dissipation is. And as you can see here, it's, it's fairly small. Switching losses. So the, the switching losses the, is exactly the same as with the brush motor. Okay, you're driving an inductive load and, and therefore your turn on and turn off losses, your driver requirements 
are all the same as in the example for the brush motor. So the, the low side MOSFET power dissipation, right, uh, that conducts during the off time of the high side MOSFET, um, and it can be used to reduce power dissipation versus using only the body diode. Uh, the low side MOSFET uh, switches at zero volts. So because the body diode is conducting during the period before and after you turn on the low side MOSFET, the voltage across that MOSFET when it switches is going to be approximately zero. And so usually you ignore switching losses in the low side MOSFET in a, a, a synchronous type converter or, or uh, motor drive. So the low side MOSFET losses are now uh, just DC losses, which is equal to the RMS current times the RDS on, very similar to in the brush motor example. Just to, to give you an example of, of an advantage of why you would use the low side synchronous MOSFET instead of just a diode, even though the driver requirements are a little bit more complicated, uh, let's take this example over here. If we were to use a MOSFET in this example, okay, we calculate the power dissipation with a 20 milliohm MOSFET at about one watt. Now, if we were to use a diode with approximately a, a one volt forward voltage drop at that current, Okay, you would calculate about five watts of power dissipation. And so for very small motor circuits, it may or may not be an advantage, but for higher current, higher power motors, there is certainly an advantage uh, in both efficiency and size power dissipation for using a synchronous uh, method of, of commutating the motor current. So let's go through some uh, MOSFET driver calculations. We've gone through a lot about how to calculate power dissipation in the MOSFET, how to size the MOSFET. Now let's talk about how to drive that MOSFET. We went to the, into this a little bit in calculating what the turn on and turn off times were based on the, the MOSFET driver. Uh, pretty much to summarize, uh, when you turn on the MOSFET, you're applying VDD, um, and then you turn on the MOSFET in the period between the threshold and when the Miller effect has, has, uh, has uh, completed. Um, when you turn off the MOSFET, uh, it's the same thing but in reverse. So now you want to make sure that the power dissipation in this MOSFET driver um, doesn't exceed its, its rating. So what you want to do is you want to take a look at the MOSFET uh, charges and just you know how what the gate charge is for charging and discharging and that will let you know what power is dissipated uh, both in the driver and in any external resistance so the charge you want to look at from the gate charge graph in a data sheet is the gate charge the total the total gate charge at a particular drive voltage so in this example if VDD was 10 volts you would see that the gate charge in this example is, is about 17 nanocoulombs, and that's the total gate charge. Now you can figure out driver dissipation um, by looking at the amount of charge that's uh, brought in and brought out of the uh, MOSFET and how it um, divides between the impedances of the gate driver, uh, any external resistance, and the internal resistance of the uh, MOSFET gate. So using this formula here, we can calculate what that power dissipated is in the, um, in the MOSFET driver. So let's talk a little bit about um, switching frequency um, and, and uh, the requirements. And Basically, switching frequency is a requirement of, of the control circuitry, of, of the type of architecture that's being used. Um, there are certain things like you want to make sure the switching frequency is greater than the audio frequency so that there is no audible uh, vibrations from, uh, from the motor. Um, you also have um, uh, requirements for the control method. Uh, in some cases, you have to have a, a uh, fairly fast switching frequency uh, in order to um, to use a certain method of, of control, especially with uh, sine wave kind of controls and so forth. Um, 
from a power dissipation standpoint inside the, the, the uh, driver and the, the, the drive circuitry and, and the drive amplifier uh, in the bridge, uh, switching frequency will affect the switching losses um, alone. So whatever architecture is used, whatever kind of control method is used, um, whatever is selected for that particular application, uh, need to know it's an important part of figuring out what power dissipation is inside of the, um, of the bridge for the, the motor driver. Let's talk about um, uh, some of the data sheet parameters uh, when selecting the, the MOSFETs. Um, we had um, already gone through uh, calculating current through the MOSFETs and the power dissipation in that MOSFETs, how to do that. Uh, there's also the, uh, the gate to source and gate to drain uh, ratings of the MOSFETs. Uh, we had shown that earlier that arm resistance is proportional to the uh, gate to source voltage. Some MOSFETs are fully enhanced at 5 volts. Some MOSFETs are fully enhanced at, at 10 or 12 volts. Uh, some MOSFETs have uh, 20 volt maximum gate to source voltage, and some have lower. And, and so when you pick the MOSFET for a particular application based on the voltage and, um, and the arm resistance, uh, you also have to be aware of what the uh, gate drive requirements are in terms of voltage um, and in terms of uh, gate charge in, in order to make sure that your MOSFET driver can drive those MOSFETs uh, correctly. Another um, important part is the uh, diode reverse recovery inside the body diode. As we saw, um, if you operate at a higher frequency or you have a lousier diode that has a much slower uh, reverse recovery, uh, you will have uh, power dissipation in the high side MOSFET and that has to be accounted for as well. So when you pick a MOSFET, um, even though it may be the lowest cost MOSFET, uh, you have to make sure that it will operate properly um, within the, the bridge circuit that you're designing. As far as the MOSFET driver, uh, again, you want to make sure that the driver is rated for the gate drive voltage that can be supplied, um, that it has um, enough peak uh, drive current, that the, in other words, the pull up and pull down resistances, and the gate drive voltage that you're using can supply enough current uh, to turn on the MOSFET and turn off the MOSFET as fast as needed. Uh, packaging, uh, power dissipation, uh, also, some packages are better than others for uh, parasitics as well. That's something that should be taken into account. Um, uh, rise and fall time, again, that depends on the MOSFET and the drive capability. Um, we had talked a little bit about, um, let's talk about anti-shoot through and, and dead time. Um, in half-bridge circuits, synchronous half-bridge circuits, you have to make sure that both MOSFETs are not on at the same time. One way to do this is by allowing uh, ample dead time on the input signals to the driver uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen. But if you put too much dead time into the circuit, you end up with more power dissipation. And you also end up with slightly less uh, maximum duty cycle for, for driving the motor at, at its fastest speed. Some MOSFET drivers that are on the market will either take a single signal or will take both signals but they have circuitry inside uh, that will prevent both outputs driving the MOSFETs uh, from uh, being on at the same time. And, and that's also a consideration when you're choosing your, your MOSFET driver. Thermal considerations. Uh, we had talked about calculations for power dissipation in the MOSFET, also power dissipation in the driver. Um, you use the data sheet parameters and the values that you calculated in order to calculate what the maximum junction temperature is for these devices. If the junction temperature is exceeded based on high power dissipation or high ambient temperature, you have to go back through the design, choose a MOSFET that either uh, has lower switching loss or lower RDS on or lower uh, reverse recovery in order to keep the temperature below the uh, maximum rating. Junction temperature of, of a part 
whether it's the driver or the MOSFET or any component, is equal to the ambient temperature times power dissipated in that part times the thermal resistance from the junction to the ambient. The maximum junction temperature and, and thermal resistance for these components is specified in the data sheet. Um, the total thermal resistance, right, which is from the junction to air, uh, varies with a few items such as uh, the heat sink or copper area that the part is mounted on, uh, airflow, uh, whether or not you have thermal vias going to different layers to help spread that heat out, as well as other components generating heat on the board that'll heat up the board or the air around the components and raise the ambient temperature even higher. Here's a, um, just, a, just a, as a quick example, here's a graph um, that relates uh, PC board heat sink uh, thermal resistance to copper area. And what you can do is you could, there are, are several parameters for a component for thermal resistance. One is junction to air, that's based on a standard layout or a standard amount of copper. Um, but these components also have thermal resistances from the junction to the case or to the lead. And if you have that information, the junction to case thermal resistance of, for example, this MOSFET, uh, you can also figure out what the approximate copper thermal resistance is from the board to the air. Combining these two gives you a total thermal resistance that you can use for, um, for, for uh, your calculations and this gives you a little bit more accurate calculation rather than using um, a standard, uh, say, one square inch uh, per print of copper, which is what most of the theta JAs are, um, are related to. So let's do a real quick uh, example for temperature rise. Let's say um, in this example, uh, junction to ambient or junction to case uh, are 52 degrees and 2 degrees. You're um, ambient temperature that you have to operate in is uh, 70 degrees, there's no airflow. Um, and we're using, uh, from the previous example, the high and low side FETs on the switching side, which were both 1.2 watt dissipation, and the always on FET on the other side of the bridge uh, in the full bridge example, uh, which was about two watts. So for the high and low side MOSFETs, okay, um, you're looking at uh, approximately uh, 50 degrees C, right, plus uh, 54 degrees C per watt times the power dissipation, it's about 115 degrees C. In this case, your uh, non-switching FET uh, junction temperature is about 158 degrees C, and that's because of the higher power dissipation. So in this case, right, if the MOSFET, for example, has a maximum junction temperature of 150 degrees C, you realize that uh, you have to have a lower arm resistance to lower the power dissipation, lower the temperature. So in this particular case, the high side MOSFET can be um, acceptable in terms of power dissipation, but the design has to be reiterated with a lower RDS arm resistance on the non-switching FET in order to prevent the die temperature from exceeding um, the, uh, the maximum. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the um, circuitry uh, above and beyond just a basic bridge uh, or a three-phase bridge uh, that you would use to drive a motor. Uh, talk a little bit about controlling the rise and fall times um, and the effects that they have, um, negative voltage clamping, the negative voltage that occurs on the motor winding and how that affects uh, the driver. And also, in these high side drives, um, we use bootstrap capacitors because the high side is, is floating. And so there are some calculations that um, you can use for uh, calculating what capacitor you need for the, the boost capacitor. Um, let's talk about the bootstrap capacitor first. If you look at how this circuit works, okay, um, when the low side MOSFET is on, the switching node, all right, or the motor uh, terminal node, is at zero volts, approximately. VDD, let's call it 10 volts, will now charge this bootstrap capacitor through this diode. When the high side turns on, the low side turns off and the high side turns on, 
as the high side turns on, the voltage at this node increases to the bus voltage, but this floating or flying capacitor, the bootstrap capacitor, maintains that VDD voltage across it as this flies up and provides voltage to the high side MOSFET gate to both continue to turn it on as well as to uh, maintain the voltage on it uh, because there is a little bit of discharge here. So you can calculate um, what size capacitor that you, you need, what the minimum capacitor you need based on um, the uh, amount of charge that's delivered into the gate of the capacitance um, and the size of the capacitor as well. Uh, if, for example, you, you assume a certain voltage that you don't want this to discharge past, using that voltage, knowing the charge of, of the MOSFET, you can figure out what the uh, minimum size of this capacitor is. And that would be the uh, total gate capacitance uh, divided by the change in voltage um, that you want on that particular um, uh, capacitor. And usually you don't want more than a few tenths of a volt uh, on the capacitor. So we also showed that uh, there's a, uh, in, in that example, we put in a series resistor um, in series with, with the, the capacitor here. And what this does is, is uh, uh, two things. Number one, uh, it will limit the amount of uh, current when you initially charge this capacitor. Um, instead of, uh, if usually these are ceramic capacitors, they're very low impedance. Um, and you have a good stiff supply over here, so this current can, can, can be fairly, um, fairly high uh, or relatively high. By adding a resistor in here, you can reduce that current, and that reduces some of the noise in the circuitry when it's operating. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about our reducing noise uh, in, in just a bit. Um, the other uh, uh, consideration when selecting a capacitor um, is for a bootstrap capacitor is the leakage through the device when the device is on. Uh, there is some current that leaks to ground from the high side drive circuitry when it's floating. And, and that will discharge the uh, bootstrap capacitor. So if you're on for a long period of time in, in the range of milliseconds or so, which may be um, uh, correct for, for motor operation at, at high duty cycle or 100% operation, uh, you have to make sure that the capacitor is large enough to prevent uh, it from discharging uh, too low to drive that, that gate. So why would you want to control uh, switching speeds? Uh, there's a few, a few reasons for controlling switching speeds. One of them is in EMI. Um, the faster you turn this on and off, okay, the more energy there is in, in the transition. If, if you look at this basic graph, this is essentially uh, voltage over time and normalized. And you can see that there's a certain amount of uh, energy in the, um, in the pulse. Okay? Um, and then this over here is the on time. So after, at certain on times, as your on time starts to increase, um, there's more energy. Basically, there's more energy left in, inside this, this pulse. Um, as your on time becomes more narrow, uh, this becomes smaller, and there's less energy in this pulse. But you can see here that for a given on time, um, that energy is, is decreasing at about 20 dB per decade. The next um, inflection point is with the rise or fall time of this waveform. So the faster this waveform is, Okay, the, the faster the switching speed, okay, the further out this will be, right? And you have more energy here because after the rise or fall time, after the transition time, you fall off at 40 dB per decade instead of 20 dB per decade. So when you're looking at radiated emissions, the less energy you have, uh, the better off you are in terms of, of conducted and, or especially radiated emissions. Slowest, uh, uh, slower uh, transition time uh, will improve that. However, as we saw before, the slower the transition time, the more power dissipation in the 
um, in the MOSFET. So this is a, a compromise that has to be made. Another reason for slowing down the, uh, the transition time is uh, we call it uh, DVD-induced uh, shoot-through. So if you look at, if you look at the low side st structure of the, of the half bridge, okay, uh, you will see that um, the voltage transition over here, as the voltage increases, there's a capacitance from drain to gate, right? And then there's also impedances from gate to source uh, through the capacitance of the MOSFET, as well as through the driver, any impedances within the, the, the loop of the drive circuit. When you have a rising transition here, it induces current, which at this point will start to induce a voltage on the low side MOSFET gate. And you could see that on the low side MOSFET gate voltage that when this turns off, the voltage here is low. Then after the dead time, you turn on the high side, the voltage on the drain of this MOSFET increases. And on the source, you see a small induced glitch. The problem is if this glitch exceeds the threshold of the low side MOSFET, the MOSFET turns on and you have shoot through. So the slower you make this transition, the smaller the induced glitch, right? The smaller the induced current, the smaller the induced glitch, and the less chance you have of, uh, of shoot through. And a third reason for, um, for reducing the, the on and off times is parasitic ringing, uh, which also affects EMI as well as um, you know, negative voltages and, and, uh, on, the, um, on, on the ground and on the gates. So how do we control switching speed? All right. um, there's a few ways to do it. Uh, one of the more common ways is to add resistance in series between the gate drivers and the MOSFET gates. Uh, what this does is it limits the amount of current that can flow into the gate, or you could look at it as it slows down the RC charge and, and discharge. Sometimes, however, you, you want to turn the MOSFET on slowly, okay, to prevent uh, the, the problems we saw on the previous slide. But you want to turn the MOSFET off a little quick, more quickly because uh, you want to reduce the amount of power dissipation in the MOSFET. In that case, you can add uh, another resistor, which is usually smaller than the uh, on resistor, the series resistor here, and, and put a diode in series. So during the turn on, the diode blocks, and you have a much slower turn on. During turn off, the diode conducts, and you have a much faster turn off. You can do that on the high or the low side as well. Um, another way to do this is to add a resistor in series with the driver or with the, um, the uh, bootstrap capacitor. And what this will do, instead of having um, all the resistance over here, you could add this resistor. This will slow down the turn on time only. If you look at the conduction path during turn on, um, power comes through the uh, voltage is, is supplied by the bootstrap capacitor through the output to the gate and then back to the source, back to the capacitor again. So this resistor is in series when it's, in, and it's turning on, slows down the turn on time. During um, turn off, the discharge path is uh, through the uh, MOSFET gate to source through the driver and the switch node. And in this case, you avoid having to go through the resistor in the HB pin, and that makes a faster uh, uh, turn off time. Here's an example. We talked about DVD induced uh, turn on. Here's a, an actual practical example. If you look at the, um, the switch node and the gate of the low side MOSFET, uh, you can see that in this case over here, um, the uh, DVDT of the switch node induces a voltage on the low side of the MOSFET gate. And you can see that there's a lot of ringing. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, high currents that will be flowing, causing the ringing and causing a distortion of the switch node waveform. Um, to prevent this, you would use a lower resistance on your um, on the low side gate drive. So you want to minimize the impedance between the gate of that MOSFET and ground, okay? 
And you also can do, um, I have this by uh, improving the layout, making a much smaller loop, reducing the inductance in the loop of the low side gate drive during turnoff. Um, and also by picking a MOSFET with a low gate to drain over gate to source uh, capacitance. What this will do is increase the impedance, right, smaller capacitance, increases the impedance from drain to gate, and a higher gate to source capacitance lowers that impedance from gate uh, to the source or, or to ground. And so this will uh, uh, create a, a capacitive voltage divider effect that will tend to lower the induced voltage on the, uh, on the gate of the low side MOSFET. Uh, let's go through a, 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 another uh, item here, um, and that is negative voltages on the switch node. During um, the MOSFET, high side MOSFET on time, current flows through the phase of the motor. Uh, when you turn this MOSFET off, okay, current now has to flow through the low side MOSFET. During, and because there's a dead time between these two, Current will first flow through the body diode or an external diode in this, in this uh, path over here. And when you have high motor current, you have the forward voltage drop of the diode and also fast switching currents because the MOSFETs turn on and off quickly. You have parasitic inductance and capacitance that will cause the voltage on the switch node, on the phase motor node, to go negative. So if current's flowing here and this is ground, you have about maybe a volt or so of reverse voltage or negative voltage due to the forward conduction of the diode. Um, and then there's parasitic inductances that will also generate a voltage across them, which will bring the voltage on this node even lower. If that voltage gets too low, too far negative, it can cause issues with the MOSFET driver, which can cause latch up, uh, it can cause, cause false triggering or, or even damage to the uh, to the MOSFET driver itself. So there's a, a resistor that you could add between the switch node or the phase node and the HS node of, a, of the MOSFET driver. And what this will do is it will reduce the amount of voltage that is seen on the driver itself. You could also put a clamping diode um, between the uh, MOSFET driver's uh, switch node and ground to further prevent uh, uh, substrate currents from flowing in the driver and causing latch up and, and, and um, uh, failure as well of the driver. Something to, uh, to keep in mind. So that's pretty much it. Um, I would like to thank you for watching this and I hope that you have gotten something out of it.